while you're enjoying your fellowship and finishing up your dessert, uh, I want to continue our program by asking Mark Emmerman to come and introduce our speaker. Uh, Mark is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Center for Christianity and Business and the current trustee of the university. Mark is also a HBU grad and currently serves as the managing director and head of Scotiabank's global energy practice. Ma. Thank you, Ernest. Well, if that was for me, thank you. Um, I get uh, the pleasure of doing the introduction on my friend uh, Mark McCollum. And Mark sent me some notes, you know, for introduction. What fun are prepared notes? I'm going to put those down, um, especially when you're introducing a friend. Uh, when I was um, driving over here, and I was just saying a prayer, asking for some guidance on what I should say to introduce Mark, it came to me right there at the last minute. Uh, on the corner of the intersection over here at the Arena Theater, I don't know if any of you noticed it when you got off the freeway, but the uh, upcoming performance, the monkeys. Just like when I was in school. Um, and um, does anyone remember the monkeys' big hit? I'm a believer. Thank you, Peg. So what a, see, what a great segue, you know, into the speech. I was worried um, where this was going. Back, back in those days, uh, you know, with the monkeys, you know, when we all had long hair and, you know, wore big glasses. Uh, well, I guess, Mark, I mean, we had big glasses, didn't we? Um, but uh, Mark is uh, Chief Financial Officer of Halliburton. And for, to be in a role like that for a large multinational public company, I don't even know, I realized when I stood up here what Mark's topic is going to be, but I can tell you one thing from having heard him speak many times, it will be like the monkeys, I'm a believer, uh, unabashedly so. And Mark is uh, also, we've got some other friends that are here today, Tim McKenzie somewhere in the room. Uh, rather than talk a lot about you know, Halliburton or Mark's past background with Tenneco as well, I'd also add in there that he has a home Bible study that he and Tim McKenzie do I think it's on Tuesday nights. Tim I went to high school with, I know he's around here, I, there you are back in the room. Uh, this is a guy who memorizes entire books of the Bible at a time and will tell you it nonstop if you ever ask him to. Mark of course memorizes the tax code. Uh, I will assure you Tim would be more fun to ask to repeat something than Mark would in that line. But you know if you can really choose a man by his friends, you know there, there are some great friendships right there and a good solid individual. Um, Mark and his wife have been friends of ours for quite some time. He's also on the board of regents of Baylor University. My daughter's going there. I'm just very proud to see what that university does as well. So please welcome uh, my good friend here, Mark McCollum. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, this is going. There we go. Sorry, I don't want to reverb. Thanks, Ernest, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks to the uh, Center for Christianity and Business for the invitation to come and uh, speak with you guys today. It's, I think it's a, an incredible um, organization, you know, within the um, Houston Baptist University, broader organization, and love the work that you're doing, Ernest. Ernest and I met, it was about a year ago, something like that, uh, for the first time. Of course, he's a has a... a former Halliburton legacy as well, and with some mutual friends. He hired, uh, he, he continues to remind me that my best lieutenant, I think he hired, and, uh, and so um, a guy named Christian Garcia, who's, uh, who's uh, many times I've referred to as my right arm in our business. And uh, so I appreciate that, just the fact that, uh, that he brought in some special talent to, uh, to Halliburton, and, uh, and now here um, working at the university. I also want to acknowledge uh, Robert and, uh, and the uh, Board of Trustees here at Houston Baptist University. Of course, being now on the Board of Trustees at Baylor, you know, become much more uh, engaged and interested and, and thoughtful about how universities do what they do. And I was sh sharing with Robert um, uh, just a moment ago that, that even at Baylor University, we still, from a, from a vision and strategy standpoint, anchor on the, the, what we call the 2012 vision that Robert created when he was there at Baylor. And of course, I'm, I'm very familiar with the 10 pillars and what, what's happening here at Houston Baptist University. And it's, it's just exciting. I mean, it's, I think it's exciting for um, the city of Houston, but I think it's most, most exciting for the kingdom 
and uh, and I, my hats off to uh, to the leadership of the university and what you're doing here, and it just speaks to the power of vision, you know what what uh, when when you when you put vision in front of people and and create strategy around that and everybody's working together what what great things can uh, can be accomplished. So when Ernest asked me to, to come and talk today, it was a little bit open. Mark identifying you know what what's your topic going to be and. Uh, but, but obviously, you know, what, what, what Ernest has basically said is, you know, I'm, because of this, this is the Center for Christianity and Business, you know, what, what most people are interested in is, is how in the world can you be a Christian, particularly as a, an executive in a major uh, corporation, and particularly a major corporation like Halliburton, of all, all, all folks. You know, not, uh, we, we certainly sometimes have a reputation out there, as, at, and uh, whether it's deserved or not, and, uh, and it's... And when he when he kind of when he laid that topic out, you know, it was one of those things. Where I was like, okay, absolutely, I know what I'm going to do and talk, because um, I have, you know, being in this role at Halliburton, and recognizing some of the reputational issues that we uh, face day in and day out, I've developed a bit of a passion around this idea. I mean, it's such an important topic, I think. And and I would also say probably my background having. Uh, worked for Arthur Anderson here in Houston in the pipeline industry, being uh, fairly close, even though I left Anderson in the mid-90s, was close enough to the flame, I would say, in terms of what happened with Anderson and the Enron debacle in, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s that, you know, I, I've, I've been fairly introspective about why things like that happen, you know, and that recognizing that there were good people you know, it wasn't as black and white always as the press laid things out, but that there were Christian men, there were Christian women that were involved, that were made decisions in that process, and, and yet got caught up in that situation. And, and, you know, what could have been different? What could have been different within the Enron organization and leadership? What could have been different within the Anderson leadership? And having thought about that, you know, it's helped me to kind of frame more thoughts about uh, Christian leadership, Christ, the need for Christian business leadership. I mean, the fact of the matter is we've got a significant pr um, problem in corporate America today. You think about it, wherever you look, wherever you read, you know, the, the general public no longer trust corporate executives. They don't trust corporate America. I, I look at various polls and, and traditionally corporate executives rank uh, just lower than, um, I think, psychics and prostitutes and you know you look at those I mean it's just I, I, it, it's it's actually kind of scary and uh, and I and so you know I, I, one of the great examples I remember going with my nieces and nephews they took me to the Muppet movie and this has been a little while anybody remember the Muppet movie that came out who was the bad guy in the Muppet movie it was a it was a greedy oil executive okay he was going to tear down the Muppet theater to drill an oil well and I walked out of there of course, they're all laughing. What a great movie. And I'm thinking, that was the, the worst movie I've seen in my life. <laughs> but, but, you know, because that's, that has become the perception in, in, uh, in America today, around the world, that this is, that's the type of executives that we have. And, of course, all the misbehavior in corporate America that, that has taken place, either the public scandals or, you know, sort of what I'm just going to lay out there, the, uh, the hubris that has sort of crept in among many executives in terms of, of compensation issues and things of that nature um, serve to alienate the rest of the population, particularly those who have less. And we're in a world where the haves and the have-nots, I mean, we've, we've become more polarized. And in today's 24-7 news cycle, it doesn't matter whether it's well-founded or not, that perception becomes reality in their minds over time. So just as a corporate executive, we've got a problem. Now I'm also going to submit to you that I think, well, this is my, my own opinion, but that church misbehavior has also been damaging to the public's attitudes about the worth of Christianity. You know, when we talk about being a Christian business leader and bringing that into the corporate world, you know, others have got to look at that and say, so what? You know, why are you different? How are you behaving differently? Than the rest, of, than the rest of corporate executives, you know, is there something of value to be gleaned? And and oftentimes, again, you know, when you look at the press and some of the scandals that have happened in the uh, ecumenical church, uh, I don't think, 
you know, serve to help us broadly. And I think also that, um, and I, I'm just going to lay this out there, that oftentimes the church is perceived as intolerant or, or um, uh, we, we tend to be a bit selfish, you know, in terms of how we approach what, Christ, you know, what the real value of Christianity is. It, it looks selfish to the rest of the world, and in my humble opinion, selfishness repels. Selfishness repels. Howard Hendricks had a quote that's sort of one of my favorites, that there's no smaller man, no smaller package than a man wrapped up in himself. And I think that that's, that's wholly true. And so, you know, as we think about being Christian leaders, we've got to, to, to bring something different to the table that the world can see as something of value. The third thing I think is, is a problematic area here, and I see this increasingly with the young people that we bring into even our organization, is that relativism and its sister political correctness is rampant. And uh, it, it, it permeates our society and everything that we do, and I think that that relativism, it, 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 it demonstrates itself in several different ways. One is, uh, you know, we, we think about situational ethics. You know, we, we define what's good based on what the situation is or the circumstances, which is problematic. But I think even worse, particularly for corporate America, is this notion that within relativism that I may have my beliefs and my fundamentals, but I certainly have no right or, or uh, obligation to watch you or to call, make, you know, create an accountability with you about what those are as well. Okay, I, so, you know, uh, as an example where I see this as problematic is, is the Enron situation, right, where there were folks that knew things were going wrong, but no one stood up because they didn't feel like it was their obligation to stand up, and the organization went down. Um, outside of corporate America, you know, I, I, I see this uh, probably most glaringly in the Lance Armstrong situation. You know, the fact that he doped, okay, is one thing. The thing that's bothered me the most is that Lance Armstrong won seven Tour de France titles with a team, a full organization who knew he did, and yet said nothing. And yet said nothing. That troubles me more than the fact that he doped, as bad as his doping was. And so this relativism, as it permeates our society, creates a larger um, obligation on the part of leadership in corporate America to be different. We have to call call our organizations to a different level of action as regard to, uh, to this uh, idea of what, you know, what Christianity, or at least Christian moral absolutes, bring to the table. And then finally, of course, what complicates it, and this is, is where I live within the Halliburton organization, uh, largely, is we're a global organization. We've got 70,000 employees in 80 countries around the world. You know, just in my organization, in the uh, in the staff at, uh, at, at, in finance, we've got 15 to 1,800 people, and only 300 or so of those are in the Houston area. You know, so we're, we're dealing with all sorts of ethnic backgrounds, uh, cultural back backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and all of those folks bring something different to the table in terms of what, they're, you know, what they may perceive as being absolutes. And it makes it more difficult as a Christian and thinking about, you know, our call to reconcile the world to, to, um, to God, right, to, in terms of stepping out there, is how do we step forward and be obvious and assertive in our Christianity, uh, you know, when you've got such a, a wide variety of folks that are in these organizations. So, you know, these are, these are questions that I love to, to contemplate and think about. They're very important questions, and I'm glad that that the center here is, is thinking about those and, and having a public debate and hopefully creating some encouragement because the fact is we need more Christian business leaders, right? Fundamentally, we need more Christian business leaders. We need more business leaders, but we need more business leaders to step out in being Christians. And that means by, in my view, you know, uh, uh, coming out and, and demonstrating a faith, a, a, you know, a strong faith that's evident both in their words and in their deeds. And when I talk about words, I'm, I'm basically saying that, that uh, they're helping through their leadership to either define or redefine the, the, uh, their companies or their firm's values 
in terms of, of uh, you know, what, what, what they want their people to be and uh, what they want their people to do. And it has to be anchored in absolutes. And that happens, you know, in words sort of in two ways. One, they've got to talk about it, right? It's got to be something that they, they lay out. They've got to be personal examples, right? It's important for leadership in our corporations to become true examples of character and integrity day in and day out. What they say, they do what they say, they, um, and, and uh, they follow through, and it has to happen every single day. The second thing that has to happen, part of this, um, is that they've got to hold people accountable. I think one of the things that I've seen over my career is, is where, you know, we, there are moral failures in organizations and folks fail to follow through, you know, in terms of levying consequences against those moral failures because business, profits, a big account, something of that nature trumps the idea that, or, or tenure trumps the idea that, you know, there's got to be a consequence to failing to follow what, you know, the firm states as being its code of business conduct. So I'm a, I've tried to be a little bit of a stickler within our own organization, as hard as it is. I had a situation just recently, and it pains me. And I, I pray about it a lot, you know, when we do that, but yet oftentimes, because of the size and scale of our organization, if I fail to act in some of those areas, not just personally, but, uh, but also in terms of carrying through and making sure that the people that work for me act in that same way, I can, you know, over time, you know, my witness, I think, as well as, you know, my notions about what are the right things to do begin to get murky for the people that work for me. It's already difficult, difficult enough to, uh, to communicate, you know, in terms of you know, doing video conferences or whatever else. I mean, but ultimately, my actions speak best. And that's where I said word and deed, and in, in, in basically saying, indeed, as we exercise our faith, corp, uh, Christian business leaders need to be more proactive in, um, I think, in stepping out and addressing, you know, the needs of the people that work for them and the needs of the, peoples in the people in the communities in which they work. All right, and I, and I say that, you know, there's, I, need to, I need to be an example of Jesus Christ not just in terms of what I see is right and wrong, but also in terms of carrying out the mission. When I look and I, I see what Jesus Christ did in his life, right, he, he definitely had a social mission about him, right? He, he was looking for unmet needs, whether that was a need for encouragement or whether that was the need for food, as absolute as that might be. And so we're, so, you know, for me, increasingly over time, I've just had this burden that ultimately we've got to, to be more about sustainability. I, well, that's when it's a buzzword in corporate America today, but well, fundamentally what it means is that in the communities that we live and work, we as corporate leaders need to be push, need to be doing it personally and then corporately pushing back to try to meet unmet needs, whether it's food, you know, addressing poverty, homelessness, whatever else in our communities. And then I think also, and this is where it really is really important for Halliburton, is thinking more about things like environment, environmental issues, right? The, 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 uh, uh, when we develop new technologies, are we uh, thinking about clean water and, and minimizing our footprint and doing things that, you know, ultimately others look at and say, these are good things. They are good things for our community and you're, you're making a difference in the lives of those around you. And then finally, I just in this concept of being bold in our faith, I would just close that we need Christian business leaders to be courageous. And this is where I think, you know, just so, so many times I, I, it, I'm disappointed, but it means that we've got to be willing to step forward and do the right thing, regardless of circumstances, regardless of the consequences, you know, that, that if, if I'm asked to do something that I know is not right, I'm not going to do it. I don't care what happens. And I'm always going to try to move quickly to, come, you know, to bring things to the right, con right conclusion or the right decision. Um, and it just, it takes courage. And it's a courage that's only, um, I think, framed in walking by faith. So with that kind of notion, I get, um, in thinking about my role, I, I wanted to talk for just a few minutes about 
my approach to you know, how I operate in my role as CFO of Halliburton. It's something that's, you know, I think, been founded over 33 years of a career. It's not something that you know, you know, I've read, read in a book, but I think it's sort of the accumulation of, of experiences and uh, mentors, discipleship in my life. I would be, I would, I would be amiss if I did not acknowledge the importance of my wife in my life. Um, because, you know, coming out of college, I was, I was a, just, you know, sort of an okay, you know, what I would call maybe a cultural Christian. I went to church and we, we did our thing, but it really wasn't as real to me as probably it needed to be. My wife, you know, had a, had a much more dynamic and living faith. And as we, as we grew together in our early years of marriage coming right out of college, uh, she made a huge difference. And, uh, and, I, and so some of these things, you know, are kind of born out of us doing life together and growing together. And, uh, and so her, we, she is my best friend uh, and uh, as, as well as my soulmate. But I, but I think that in many ways, um, from a spiritual standpoint, we, uh, we connect very well and she's helped with this. So there's sort of three things that I want to share with you in terms of, you know, being a Christian in the executive suite. Uh, and what, what I think are most important. The first thing is exercising a kingdom mindset. Okay, and what I mean by that, well ultimately, you know, we, we're Christians, we all come to Christ at, um, for a multitude of reasons, right? Uh, we, we come in crisis, you know, something's happening in our life. Uh, I, I realize that I'm a sinner and I'm, you know, I need, I'm in need of salvation and eternal life. Uh, but it's interesting when I think about that, most of, this, most of us come to Christ for entirely selfish reasons, right? There's something I need, and, that, and Jesus can fill that need. But ultimately, I think what the Bible encourages us to, to do is we've got to mature and step out from there and grow up and begin to see things differently. So my path to ultimately doing that really started with God's Word and becoming a student of God's Word. Now, when I, we were young, and we actually, we joined Second Baptist Church here in Houston, 1984, and I remember, you know, I was, I was kind of this cultural Christian, and my wife suggested, hey, let's go over and hear Dr. Young at Second Baptist, and we, we rolled in, it was still in the, their old sanctuary, and it was the most amazing thing I'd ever heard, because Dr. Young got up and he said, open your Bibles to Romans 2, and all of a sudden you heard this <laughs> through the entire um, sanctuary. I never heard a sound like that, ever. And it's like all of a sudden, you know, and, and people then, you know, basically opening up God's Word and, and then just, I mean, it was amazing. I'm like, hey, wait, there's a lot of stuff in this book. And, uh, you know, and, and ultimately becoming a student of, of, uh, of this book made a huge difference because it ultimately began to build a different relationship for me that I begin to sort of, you know, being a very logical, it becomes very logical, and just pouring out and jumping out, and, I, and uh, it became amazing. Uh, early, early in those years, uh, Jim Deloach, who's associate pastor over there, um, taught me basically to stop using this book as a piece of art, and it, but as a tool. And so, you know, this is what, you know, my Bible looks like today, highlights and notes, and every time that I'm in it, I write new notes. Now, this is actually an older iteration. I've got four more like these. Um, but over the years, accumulating those notes, you know, in re recording a faith journey along the way made this huge difference for me. And, I be and in it, begin begin to ask questions about, you know, what's, you know, what's my purpose? And what's my purpose in God's eternal plan here? And there's two aspects of understanding that, right? What God's eternal plan, right? I said this earlier, is to reconcile the world to himself. And then you had to sort of back up and said, okay, so what about me? What am I, what, why am I here? What, why did you show me grace? What's my role in this? And, being in, and then, of course, the, the larger question is, why in the world do I need to work? You know, had a lot of fun doing other things. What, how does work interface with all of these things? And begin to, um, and also wrestle with this idea, which, you know, every one of us in the room has recognized that there's very little cause and effect 
relationship between our personal effort and the, uh, the monetary or the positional results that we see coming out of that, right? I mean, I was working harder in my early career than I did early and not seeing a lot of results. And yet others around, you know, work very little, play golf, and yet make tons of money. And so you recognize, okay, this can't be about the money, and it certainly ne necessarily can't be about the position. You know, I, I started with Anderson, I became a partner with Anderson, and worked 14 years, joined uh, Tenneco as a vice president, and I remember being at a party and my, Jenny's, my wife's grandmother introduced me and she says, here's my, you know, uh, adopted or my, you know, grandson by marriage. He's now a vice president of oil company. He's made something of himself. And I'm thinking, what have I been doing for 14 years? You know? <laughs> but you sort of recognize that, that without this cause effect that ultimately work for just position and money is a poor result and that in my, in my um, position in God's eternal plan that ultimately I have a ministry of reconciliation, right? That's my role. And um, that, that I, I have a sort of a phrase that I've used to try to say it very simply. My role is to love God and to help others love Him too, however that looks. And it's not about becoming, you know, Executive Vice President Halliburton, it's not been, or, or any other title. That's just something that happens along the way. And recognizing that it's not about me. That's what the God's Word taught. It's not about me. And, and in that, that, you know, because God's plan for my life is a lot larger than I can ever see, um, I've just got to trust Him for the details. I've just got to trust Him and, and look beyond that. And some great examples, you know, when we, uh, uh, after I joined Tenneco, we moved and spent some time in uh, Connecticut and then in Chicago. Each of those moves were, were a, a matter of prayer. You know, knew that God had a plan in that, you know, didn't know exactly what it was, but we stepped out that. It was about the time that I met Robert and we were in, uh, talking uh, when I was in Connecticut and feeling like, I'm here, God's got something, I don't know what it is. But ultimately, you know what I discovered it was? Had absolutely zero to do about me. I was just the tool to get my wife in Connecticut and then in Chicago where she started a women's ministry and both of the churches that we're in that are still going on you know 15 years later that uh, that minister to 100 to 150 women every single week it had nothing to do with me I was just the the method to get her there and in and, and recognizing that it was great um, and so it's just a matter of saying okay God you got a plan I can't necessarily see it but I've got to just trust you for these details. And that where I talked about earlier, um, one of the things that always concerns me is just a, sort of an admonition, right? In order to be a kingdom person, we've got to get our eyes up. We've got to look up. If we're so worried about whatever's going on today, the crisis of the moment, you know, what, whatever's happening, we're going to fail to see, right? We're not trusting. Jesus taught over and over again, been studying in, in John, you know, in rec, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, you know, walking on the water, whatever else, that he's got the power, he's got, you know, he's positionally oriented, he's got, uh, he has the ability to provide. He said, I'm going to take care of you. Whoever God's given to me, I am not going to let them go. But we don't trust that enough. And so our eyes are down, we're navel-gazing so many times as Christian, and we get caught in the moment. Um, this February, we, um, we went skiing, and uh, I've only skied, I think, three times coming into that, and it had been 15 years since I'd gone skiing. We were in Colorado, kind of nervous about doing this. I mean, I know you're looking at me, I'm thinking, like, he's an athlete, right? Well, no, it's not really, <laughs> not really true. And so, so we get on the mountain that first day, and, and we hired a guide to kind of help us orient us to where we're going to go. And I'm standing there, and I've got you know, my skis on and my, I am, you know, in heavy plow position, right? I am as, you know, locked up like a board. And so I, we make like two runs and I'm just like, you know, looking this way and just freaking out. And finally the guide said, you know, he said, look, you, you can't, if you're just focused on the next turn, you're going to lose it, right? You need to look up and look at the mountain. Forget about your feet. Look at the mountain. And it was amazing when I did that, all of a sudden it all came together. 
my feet came together. And instead of focusing on the next turn, you focus down the mountain. It's like, hey, I like this and enjoy it and begin to just flow. And I think the same is true in the Christian life. If we look up and look at the horizon and what God's doing in our lives, all of a sudden things are going to flow. And we stop worrying about, you know, the latest crisis of the moment. Now, the, um, so I think that that's a big, a big, uh, a big part, establishing this kingdom mindset, in, at least in my life, has allowed me, to, I think, to, to set deep roots. And, it's, and in setting deep roots, you know, then sort of moves on to thinking about my work differently, right? You hear the concept so many times about the fact that we want to incorporate our faith into our work, right? In other words, okay, I'm, I'm working and I'm doing all this, so how do I bring my faith into the workplace? And I think about it completely different. You know, by having sort of this focus is that now it's not about incorporating my faith in the workplace. It's about incorporating my work into my faith, okay, because it becomes just a natural extension of who I am. And ultimately, success in my book ultimately is really a matter of, you know, sort of how, how am I doing in terms of being, the, what kind of person am I being rather than what am I doing. My job and I say this over and over, my job is, who, is what I do, it is not who I am. The average tenure for uh, CFOs in corporate America is five years, and I've lived with that. I've been CFO of Halliburton for five and a half years. So I'm on borrowed time. But tomorrow, <laughs> I could be flipping burgers at McDonald's. And it's okay by me, it, it's okay by me. And along the career path, I've actually, if you look at it, I've taken some steps back along the way because I felt like that's what God wanted me to do at that time. Because it really wasn't about the title, it was about the job and the people and you know, ultimately orient with them. And that's, so that's all a part about having that kingdom mindset. The second thing that I've tried to do in my life, besides sort of developing this, is establishing some external accountabilities. I don't think, you know, in, 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 a, in this type of position, it's actually very scary. I was talking to Robert at lunch uh, uh, earlier about one that I did earlier when I was, uh, had a, a female employee who was working and began to travel. We were, we were needing to travel together. And the worry about that and saying, okay, no, I can't do that. And, and so seeking permission to have my wife travel with me in order to make sure that I had a proper accountability around that area. Uh, the fact that I'm standing up here in front of you today, this speech is a part of that accountability because I recognize Every time that I get up and I talk about these things, I put a marker in the ground. And I can't walk out the door and do something different because I got a whole lot of people that have a diff different impression. And rightly or wrongly, um, it keeps me from compartmentalizing my life, right? Ultimately, I've got to try to not compartmentalize my life. I just uh, had a good friend who had this quote, it's the best quote I've ever heard. He just said, you know, just getting to that age, I just don't have enough energy to be more than one person anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it is so true. It's just so, it's too much work to try to be one person in the office and another person in church and another person in Waco. I can't do it. And so it's better to just say, look, you know, I'm just going to put these accountabilities out there and sort of stick with it. Now, part of that is also um, finding ways, you know, recognizing as the Holy Spirit has done work in my life is to. Um, I, there's giftedness, right? In teaching, there's giftedness in administration. And so I've got to get out there and, and find things to make sure that my giftedness is being used. Why? Well, if, if I can't do it in my own strength and I've got to rely on the Lord to help me do it, that means I've got to stay, have a short agenda with Him. And I've got to stay in the Word. And I've got to do these things. And I'm telling you, for me, it helps to keep me grounded by creating that accountability, you know, externally, saying, okay, I've got to stay in it. I can't, I can't dive off and go a different direction or stop doing this for any period of time. Um, so so these, these external accountabilities and placing them for me has to help, I, what I call, you know, besides establishing the deep roots is pruning, you know, fertilizing, you know, keeping things growing and, and, um, and creating opportunities. The final thing that I would tell you that's and it's probably been the most transformational thing for me as a Christian business leader is 
sort of what I call embracing the, um, the shadow of the leader effect. Has anybody ever heard the term shadow of a leader? I had an executive coach that worked with us for a little while and when I was at Tenneco in Chicago. And I'm not a coach guy. I was like, eh, you know, but as we spent some time, you know, he began to talk about certain concepts that I've, I, I have uh, embraced because they just really were remarkable. And the shadow of the leader was probably the one that, that um, made the, the biggest difference. And it's basic, he told me, he says, Mark, he says, it doesn't matter where you are, as, the, where, as a leader in this organization, in the community, whatever else, you cast a shadow, okay? People are walking under your shadow, they see that shadow, and, um, and it's, it's, you know, people pay attention. Whether you want to, believe it or not. And it's, it's interesting, Abraham Lincoln had a, a, a quote that said, uh, character is like a tree, and reputation is like its shadow. And so in thinking about that, saying, okay, you know, if that's, if that's the case as a Christian in the marketplace, embracing that shadow can be a, a highly effective way to impact lives around me and touch others. And so part of, part of embracing that, um, that shadow of the leader is, is always at least trying to be conscious of how I'm impacting others. It causes me to sort of try to be very selfless, right? Think about others first, put them first. And, and you know, the notion about loving others and or helping them uh, love God too uh, it comes into play there. It calls me to try to make sure that my behavior is very consistent, right? That ultimately every time that I make a decision, particularly the big ones, they have to be value-based and not circumstantial. And it is easy to be, make circumstantial decisions because I'm telling you, in my office, we're having to do it all the time. I get, you know, 200, 250 emails a day. We're approving things along the way, and I have to step back and say, okay, is this one where I need to stop for a second and say, what's, what's the value set here? What are the consequences and in, uh, in circumstances involved in this and make sure that I'm being consistent and behaving consistently in that? It also, and this is one of the most remarkable things that I've seen, is... Um, be, trying to be calm in a crisis. You know, people don't, they're not going to watch your behavior necessarily in just sort of every day, but when crisis hits, all of a sudden you're, you're on. And, uh, and the only way I, I know to ultimately be calm in a crisis is to sort of step back with that kingdom mindset, right? And to approach it with joy. But I would tell you over the years, just thinking about it, right, more people have commented about how I handle pressure, how I handle a crisis than any, anything else. And it creates opportunities to, to, uh, to, uh, to talk about my faith. Striving for excellence, and I, I, don't, I just try, don't ask anyone else to do something that I'm not willing to do on my own. Because you don't want to open the door for criticism or the idea that you've got other motives or agendas. Uh, for me, because of the, you know, how fast it comes, I've got to focus on what I call the blue chip issues. What does I mean by that? Well, this coach, so many years ago, gave me this blue chip. I keep it on my desk. And it's a reminder to focus on the priorities, right? You got a lot of stuff coming at you all the time and you can get bogged down in the details, just like we were talking about earlier from a kingdom mindset. He said, but, you know, Make sure that you're focused on the things that are prior priority. Be strategic and be visionary, right? Ultimately, you know, in a role as a leader, you know, people are attracted to vision. That's why I, I compliment Robert because I understand that. People are attracted to vision. People want to see where people, they want to they know where to go. Point us in the right direction, lead us. So being strategic, being visionary makes a huge difference. The final thing in this shadow of the leader effect, and it's actually the most poignant that I've found in my career, is that you've got to be focused on balance and boundaries, okay? My witness doesn't stop when I walk out the door. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, sort of a saying I have, so be here now, be here now, that I've got to give 100% when I'm at the office, but when I walk in the door at home, I need to give 100% to my wife, I had to give 100% to my kids, they need to see it, okay? 
You know, I, 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 and technology, in my view, is the enemy in this, right? You know, we see it as helping, you know, but I don't know it does, you know, because you're, we're never turned off. Halliburton operates 24-7. I've got people around the world awake all day long, 24 hours, doing things and asking things. And I could sit there and do emails all night long. But if I'm at home and I'm doing emails, okay, I may be home, but I'm not home in the minds of my wife and, and others, right? And that's, so I'm, I, 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 there's just not a place for workaholism in my book as a Christian business leader. We can't do it. It, it destroys our witness. And we've got to handle the, the, uh, the technology with care. And then finally, as part of this balance effort, and this kind of goes back to something I said earlier, we have to give. As Christian business leaders, uh, you know, for me, I've, I've established what I do with my time, with my finances, with my energy outside the workplace matters equally as much as what I'm doing at, at the office as well. And if I'm giving back financially, if I'm giving back of my time, um, and essentially sort of trusting God with that kingdom mindset to just operate with loose hands, uh, you know, people recognize it. You guys have heard the phrase, uh, uh, walk the talk. I mean, that's always along the way. And, and, and as I've thought through this issue, right, you know, so it's a nice pithy phrase, right? But ultimately, when you kind of break it down, it doesn't work very well. I think it's a flawed truth. And what I've, what I've found over the years is that ultimately, as a Christian business leader, particularly in secular business for us, we have to approach it differently. And I talk about it walking the walk. I need to fo focus first on walking the walk. And if I walk the walk, ultimately, there's going to be an opportunity where God creates a chance to talk the walk. So if I, if I pay attention to those in order, walk the walk, and then be ready to talk the walk, those opportunities will come. And, uh, and I have to trust Him in that. I'll give you two examples in my life that happened. And I, and I, and I, I say this in all humility because I, I don't, um, I really had nothing to do with these type of things, right? It just was not, not apparent, but it was one of those things I think God put in front of me to sort of say, wake up, okay, you need to see this. The first actually was fairly early. It was not, not long after I joined Tenneco and uh, had this Bible and uh, was in church at Second and um, we had sat down for church and a young lady came in and sat down the road from us, and I, I recognized her, didn't know her because I hadn't been at Tenneco long, but she, she waved, and so I, we said hi, and she was an employee of mine. She was, at, I think, three deep in the organization, so it's like I, I wouldn't have probably dealt with her. I don't know that I actually dealt with her much after that, but she came in, and she had a young man with her who, who you know, had come into church, and they sat down the road from us, and we just, I, I met him, introduced myself, said who we were, and then we sat down, and we, we did church, we did our normal thing. About two weeks later, a knock on the door at my office, and she came in. I said, oh, hi, it's good to see you again. I hope you enjoy church. She said, we did. She says, by the way, I just want to thank you. I said, well, for what? She says, I want to thank you for leading my boyfriend to Christ. And I'm like, I, I didn't do anything. She goes, oh, yeah, you did. Oh, yeah, you did. She said, after he met you, and he figured out who you were, um, and then he, he said he didn't even pay attention to the sermon. Dr. Young was talking. He didn't even look at Dr. Young. He watched you the whole service. He watched you worship. He watched you study. He watched you take notes. And he walked out of there, and he said, wow, he goes, if it's good enough for him, it must be good enough for me. And I'm just like, Okay, I mean that's just that's scary. It was scary to me. It scared it scared the fool out of me because it's like okay, that's just one. I don't know who else is looking, right? <laughs> you know, you get you get very you get you know very uh, very worried about that. Second example, and this is a very recent example, um, but even more remarkable. Um, the, uh, Halbert has a, a, a fishing lodge, which sometimes take customers and and uh, and other. Uh, uh, guys too, and my wife and I had an opportunity uh, to uh, to take some bankers to, and uh, it was about six years ago. It was a, down in the Keys, and we had a wonderful weekend, three-day weekend down there with them. Didn't know any of them, 
but you know they were all working with us and we invited them to come because we had just done a, a large financing and one of the bankers was a young man he was in his early 40s who joined um, he is Middle Eastern you know I don't know that don't know that I knew his faith background but but clearly he was Middle Eastern and he and his wife lived in New York and you know he's you know he's every bit of what you would think a banker looks like you know jet black hair swoop back you know he's good looking and aggressive and dressed to the nines and his wife was beautiful and she was her own professional and you know they, they were making lots of money I, I just I, the most remarkable thing we learned is they had a chauffeur for each one of their kids to get to all their activities because they were busy and working and uh, and and so Jenny and I went down there we were just as a couple being gracious and and just transparent talking about what we do and who we were and, and all that and we went away had a fun time they got on a plane went their way and we went our way um, this was six years ago about three months ago I get a call from this guy now I had I knew that he is his bank that he had been working with had let him go he had been fired and I was like wow I don't you know I'm, I'm sure you know what he's doing is calling he wants a job you know and I don't know and so I, I waited 24 hours before I returned the call thinking I'm you know it's gonna be a hard conversation because we're not working with them anymore and uh, and so I, it was end of the day I called and, and he goes and he answered it kind of a little rough and I go hey you know what's going on and he goes hey he goes I am so glad you called and I said well what are you doing he goes well I'm in a hospital I just had open heart surgery and um, I said wow just this is kind of shocking and he goes yeah he goes you know it's been kind of an interesting couple years he had had a heart attack two years before that and then the year following that he had a failed marriage his wife and he got a divorce and he was on his own and desperate and then he got fired and he lost his job he lost his marriage he lost his friends and he you know and then um, they discovered they had a, a broader problem with his heart and he almost died he almost died and was in the hospital uh, recovering and he said you know I was thinking about my life and he goes and how screwed up my life was you know and all these things and he said and he goes and I was thinking about who had made an impact in my life and he goes and I'm calling to let you know that you did you were one of two people that I'm calling and he goes and I've just he goes and what he said was you remember when we were down at Duck Key, this, this place, and he goes, and I watched you and your wife, and I watched your relationship, and y'all were happy, and you loved each other, and I knew you were doing a Bible study that Mark talked about with young couples and talking about marriage and making that work and all that kind of stuff. And he goes, and I realized I want that. That's what I need. Six years. And I said, well, and so I just opened the door and I just, I shared my testimony. I said, well, Smokey, it's, you know, that all happens because, you know, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. I mean, that's, that's how, that's what drives my bus. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I know that. He goes, I'm not a Christian. He goes, but I've just found a Bible and I'm reading it. And we talked for another hour or so and I shared with him some passages to read and all that kind of stuff. But it was a remarkable deal three-day weekend 72 hours not saying anything but just being just living just just trying to walk it and create that opportunity for it and that's those are just two you know over my career I've had a number of these of different people have come up and said because your walk this happened and uh, and I, I think in this day and age in the Christian business world that has to be the most effective way we can as business leaders get out there and share the good news the gospel of Jesus Christ it just is you know trying to go hard at it is just not culturally acceptable and so creating those opportunities ultimately you know is a very effective way and I recognize that it's not me I mean I know I'm good looking and they got the presidential hair but the fact of the matter is they're not attracted to me Ultimately, they're attracted to the reflected glory of Jesus Christ. So my agenda has to be as much of him as I can get, and ultimately, he'll take care of the other details. And I just want to be a part of that plan.
So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and, uh, and for you being here today.